<clears throat> this meeting will be recorded and the recording will be available in two weeks. And we'll share the link on WeChat, Facebook, and LinkedIn as well. Um, so today we're gonna focus on education as a business opportunity. Um, we are lucky to have Mariana Cole, Samuel Wu, and Danny Wong to join us today to share their views on this. Um, so for day, today's agenda, I'm gonna quickly introduce our panel speakers and we'll give them 10 to 15 minutes to uh, let them talk about what they do and their views on what they see as the opportunities in um, Chinese education sector. Um, if, for the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it in the Q&A room. Um, we'll, in the end, we will have, we will choose some questions for the panelists to answer. So for our first guest, uh, guest speaker, we have Mariana Cole. She's uh, the CEO at, at Research Study Education Group. She specializes in the education industry in China. And recently she published her first book, Investing in Dragons. Mariana holds MBA degree from Columbia Business School and bachelor's degree from University of Notre Dame. Um, she specializes in the structure of education in China and its contribution to economic growth. Our second guest is Danny Wang. He is the managing director at Four Circle Group. He holds an econo economic degree from University of Cambridge. He recently acquired two UK brands um, and implemented the international education in China by managing three international schools in China and UK. Our third, our third guest is Samuel Wu. He's the executive director at Babylon Education and the co-founding director of Marvin College in Hong Kong. He holds an executive MBA from Northwestern University and is also a NYU alumni. Prior to education, he worked at um, working finance at the Winglong Bank and Citigroup. He now manages three Marvin colleges in Qingdao, Chengdu, and Hong Kong. So now I'm gonna pass on to our speakers to talk, let them share their views um, on the Chinese education sector. Thank you. Um, thanks, Liana. I think I will go first um, to give a couple broad comments on the education space and, and uh, a couple of comments on my view of the sector. Um, I guess to start with, I'll just introduce the PLC education system, which I think um, for, for a lot of us is quite similar to actually the, the global um, education system, which we are more familiar with. Um, in China, we have formal and informal education, and then the formal part is mostly um, divided into preschools or kindergarten, and we have primary, middle, and high school level. And above that, we also have some vocational schools, which could be lying in the high school segments, and also um, high education, which includes universities and junior colleges. But I'll just highlight that I think um, in China, there's specific, um, some specific levels called from primary to middle, which we categorize as compulsory levels. Um, and that got a lot more uh, regulatory implications, which we, we can go into a little bit later. Um, but that's largely the um, formal education system so from preschool to um, university level. And then we have another category called informal education, which I think the main um, differentiating factor is whether you get a certificate that's actually recognized by the government. So formal education, of course, you get a certificate or a degree um, recognized by the Ministry of Education. But in informal education, that's um, loosely speaking, what we would normally call training um, companies or training centers where we go for language training or um, um, some sort of uh, language class um, language classes or other class skills training or computer classes or uh, music classes type of training so that would be more informal education um, just to, to put things into a bit more perspective um, the education market in China is huge um, as supported by a a very um, tremendous um, population. The training market is um, is slightly bigger at about two trillion RMB, but the um, but the formal space is also very big at, at one point three billion uh, trillion RMB, and of that, the private part is about seven hundred seventy uh, billion RMB. So it's very sizable market for sure. Um, and, and in terms of like kind of putting things into um, more perspectives, in 2019, right, in China, we have um, around 280,000 um, 
preschools. Um, so it's a lot of kindergartens. Of course, the size will be smaller. Um, and then we have 160,000 primary schools, um, around 50,000 middle schools, 20, 25,000 high schools, and about um, 2,700 higher education institutions. So there'll be universities and kind of junior colleges. But um, in terms of student numbers, um, they're actually close to 280 million um, students across all levels. And even within the K-12 levels, there um, has been historically around 200 million or so um, in the K-12 um, levels. So that's a very sizable market in terms of population. Um, but there is definitely huge differences across penetration for private capital into these levels. Uh, as I mentioned, preschools, we have almost 300,000 preschools, right? So the actual pilot penetration into preschool or kindergarten levels is actually much higher. As you can imagine, um, the capital required um, and also the regulatory thresholds would be a little bit uh, easier for kindergarten level and become a little bit more and more challenging as we go to high levels and, and, and stricter academic requirements. So of the um, 280 million of students in China, 20% of them are actually in private schools, um, but of the 20% of them in, high, um, in private schools, about half of them actually in kindergarten. So as I mentioned, private capital is um, a lot more penetrated in um, the junior level. And, and then in uh, primary, middle and high school levels, we have about teens power penetration rate. Um, and in higher education also at about teens level. And just to, to um, also add on to that, because I, I think um, Sam and Danny will talk a lot more on the international schools. There are about 100, uh, 1,200 international schools in China. And I'll let um, the two experts to talk a lot more on, on international schools um, in terms of the curriculum and also the entry barrier. Um, but I just want to highlight why, um, why this um, industry is so interesting, education industry. I think there are definitely cultural reasons um, because in, in Asian cultures, I think um, education is widely perceived as an investment um, and also uh, more of a necessity for, for, ch for children. Um, and also in China specifically, there is this Gaokao, which is the kind of the uh, admission test um, or send exam required or that, that you do after high, uh, between kind of the high school level and the college level. So it's almost like a co college admission exam. And because of the intensity of that exam, I think, um, and, and especially the limited spots available for um, higher education institutions, that makes it very intense, I think, for everyone in China to try to excel in that final exam that you work kind of backwards and it becomes very um, uh, competitive in high school and middle school and primary school levels. Um, so I think each year the statistics is we are seeing about 18 million um, students at the college entry age, so it's around age 18, and um, up around half of them will actually de decide to take the Gaokao, so basically showing that, um, indicating that they have the interest to go pursue higher education. But of the 10 million, only 8 million actually got to into higher ed institutions, but then that will actually include universities and junior colleges. So more four year bachelor degree programs and three year junior diploma programs. Um, and, and eventually only a 4 million actually get into a bachelor program. So the bachelor program, so to, to put things kind of as a comparison, so 4 million, 4 million actually get into bachelor, all, all of the 10 million actually taking the Gaokao exam. So it is actually quite hard to get into um, a bachelor's degree program, not to say the top program. So that's why the culturally, I think it's, um, it's just so intense uh, throughout all these years for a lot of the Chinese students. And, and of course, it's very stressful for parents as well. Um, so I think that's kind of like the, the broad backdrop of the industry, um, huge market size, large numbers of schools, um, private capital going in, especially for preschool level, but also across the board, um, all the way up to university and also training companies. Um, so how do we kind of really think about it or as an investment? I think there are multiple angles that we could look into that. Um, first of all, of course, there are listed companies in Hong Kong and in the US. Um, that are education companies. Um, and, and we could actually kind of look into this type of uh, secondary kind of offering, so stocks. Um, but also there are in the primary market, there are also opportunities as uh, private equity investments or even venture capital investments. And um, I think a lot of those um, family offices in, in Hong Kong and also in China are also investing as a more of a family health investments or more as an impact investing angle. Uh, or even for philanthropy reasons. So there, there are definitely many different angles to invest in education. 
but um, just to give some some uh, flavor of what, what this looks like is um, the K-12 school. So what we call kindergartens all the way to grade 12 or kindergarten to high school, if that's kind of age range or you know, basically anyone below age 18. Um, that type of schools, so K-12 primary um, middle schools, I think average in the market, we, we talk about uh, 25 to 30% operating profit margin. So it's pretty decent um, business operation. And for high education, for the private schools, private universities, we have seen um, companies that go into the public market, like going getting listed, doing IPOs. We, we have a lot more transparency into their numbers. They, they are actually even better at like 30 to 40% operating margins. And that's largely because of the the scale. Um, universities, of course, you have large number of students, so you kind of share the fixed costs. And largely also because the student teacher ratio tends to be higher, um, as you can imagine, right? For primary schools, you will have like fewer students uh, per teacher because of the attention required. Um, and, and generally, the class size expected by parents. Um, but training companies, I think that's actually a very interesting um, market as well. Um, the two largest um, listed education companies in the world are both Chinese, and they are training companies, they are tutoring companies um, in China. And they are generating actually lower operating margins at more like mid-teens level, but because of the more business nature of it, right? So how you can replicate in a lot of the cities, the scalability of training companies are a lot easier and a lot quicker um, compared to schools. So that makes it a lot more interesting. But um, another, as I mentioned, right, another um, second or the second type of investments, more PEVC type of investments, a huge market as well. And China is dominating globally. I think um, the, the his, like in the past 10 years, we're seeing like close to 40 billion of investments going into VC and China accounts for about half of that. Um, even as recent as um, this month, October, uh, Yuan Fu Dao, which is the largest uh, pilot um, tutoring company that has yet to be listed, actually closed another round of funding and the valuation is already up to almost 16 billion. Um, and the two largest that I mentioned earlier listed in the market, they talk about like 30, 40 billion type of market cap. Um, so I think um, I would try to um, be quick with a bit more, just a couple more comments on, on my view with what's been changing recently. Um, of course, with COVID hitting um, globally, um, hitting China um, earlier and also kind of the rest of the world, um, the education market has changed massively. Um, but I think China has been quite responsive um, from the government level to the business level. The government, even as early as February already, Kind of encourage higher education institutions and um, schools to roll out all their content and open, um, the government officially open up a cloud platform. Um, high ed institutions are getting a lot of support um, to roll out, to actually introduce and roll out online um, programs. Um, but the government is also very careful and, and actually at the time I told kindergartens that they should not be launching online learning. So that's China, um, which is a bit different from, from Hong Kong and some other markets. Uh, but China has been very um, organized, I think, um, this, um, despite the, you know, the, the sudden, um, sudden um, happening of the COVID situation. But I think, I think COVID has definitely changed the, the education technology market, so to speak, or the, the education kind of investment landscape, right? Um, the large players, the training companies have been investing in online education for the past couple of years already. And it's been like kind of the main discussion point for a lot of the conversation with like the listed companies, CEOs, whatnot um, in the past few years. But I think with COVID hitting, it's definitely accelerated the whole industry shift to us um, online that I think the implication could be multiple folds. Um, obviously, I think there was a lot of discussion previously about or how, how responsive would students be, um, how, how open-minded will parents be with like, online technology and all that. But all of a sudden, overnight, everyone basically got pushed into using online platform. So I think the sample size definitely jumped quite a lot. Um, the, the amount of data that's available to all these companies jumped and, and basically spiked overnight. Um, there's huge market demand, but that also coming with that huge competition because everyone is well, even small, medium players are forced to, to actually launch their products online. So that helps a lot with um, <clears throat> data collection and fine tuning products, product innovation. But I think um, in the meantime, in the near term, we're also seeing a lot of um, competition um, going into online tech market. And that might actually take a while to, to get absorbed. Um, from a customer point of view, definitely, I think uh, most of you guys will have heard uh, positive and negative feedback with um, 
with online technology both for, for children and for ourselves. Um, so I think the longer term expectations, I would think it would still be an online offline hybrid as we move kind of beyond COVID. Um, but that's that's kind of the, the Gaokao path, the domestic path. The international path, though, I think in the education market is a little bit more affected um, because of COVID and what's happening uh, geopolitically. Um, and a, a lot of the affiliated service providers, I think, also get affected. You know, the determinists, like, for example, things like, um, you know, companies that are doing overseas test preparation, preparing students to go overseas, um, students that are actually looking to go overseas, um, maybe in the final year in high school or the, the last couple of years they're planning and they, they're now having second thoughts. So a lot of this getting disrupted, but I think medium long term still very positive on the international demand uh, for, for Chinese students going overseas. Um, and I think the the uh, the biggest unknown, uh, more of a wow factor for um, investments um, would really be regulations. I think for PEVC, um, it's more longer term kind of horizon type investments. We, we tend to look at it more medium long term. I'm actually also um, doing more high equity investments in education now. So um, a lot of these factors could be smoothed out. Um, I think we, when we're doing PEVC, but when we're doing more listed companies investments, like doing invest, like literally investing in stocks uh, where we actually get prices every day, um, the regulations have um, the regulation changes, I suppose, um, in China have been um, a key factor in driving the stock prices in the past few years. Um, ever, I guess going all the way back to like the, like the 2010 ish when when a lot of the training companies get listed, or in like 2014, 2015 when the international schools or even the private schools, local private schools in China are getting listed. Um, the stock market volatility has been largely affected by regulations. Um, so because of that factor, I think the latest regulations, without going to too much details, I would argue that the latest regulations are a little bit more favorable for higher education, for, for, for private capital going in. So private higher education companies are a little bit better positioned than um, K-12 companies, um, just because of how the regulations um, are designed with for-profit and not-for-profit categories uh, for these companies. And of course, training companies would also be a little bit more in favorable camp because of the potentially for-profit nature and potentially um, you know, the scalability and replicability of those business models. So I think um, I've taken up about 15 minutes of time. So I'll, uh, I'll just stop here and I guess we, we could um, chat a bit more later as we do the Q&A, but I'll pass on to um, Danny and Sam to talk more about you know, the operational side and the journey in the education field. Hi, Danny. Um, do you want to uh, start your session? Sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mariana and Lina. Well, um, well, first of all, if there's any question, uh, please just type it in the in the Q&A or in the chat room. So uh, any questions you can just ask and I can just answer directly if you have any any types of questions that you have. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, I think Elena explained a bit about what I do. Um, so uh, Kwa, uh, two schools in UK and uh, now we're opening up schools in China right now. Um, so they are international schools uh, in uh, different parts of China, one or two in the south and one up north. Um, in a very, uh, in a very big point of view, actually, uh, of course, as Mariana said, the education market is huge in China. Uh, but how how big it is is actually how how you actually go into the market is uh, one of the uh, key questions that a lot of people who like to do education in China ask all the time uh, because it's actually not a very um, it can be very easy to answer in some sense, as, such as you can just start some course online, uh, let's say. But uh, uh, on the other hand, it's very difficult to um, expand in scale. Um, one of the key things that you can see is as huge the market it is, um, 
the market's actually very fragmented. Um, there are many companies in China and actually, uh, although they are too big uh, listed company in, in, in the US, um, but compared to other industries such as the online or in the property market or in other industries, they are comparative, comparatively still very small uh, in size in terms of the whole market cap uh, in, in China. So um, it's one of the character of the, of the industry. Uh, let me show you all of you a PowerPoint. Right, okay. I uh, hope every, every one of you can see this. So um, what I'm going to talk about um, in general is uh, when I operate my companies in the past uh, five to six years in China, what I see. Um, and I think uh, most of you who is interested uh, to join today actually wants to know what actually are the opportunities in the market right now. Um, so I'll start with that. And then I'll talk about one of the biggest challenge in the market. Um, so all of you can understand before you enter the market. Um, so we can start, start from the top left. Uh, one, of course, uh, what's the opportunity? One is very obvious, as uh, Mariana mentioned, increasing demand for international education. Um, what, what does that actually mean is that the market of international education actually grows every year, um, about 10 to 20 percent every year in the past um, past five years in China. And that you'll, you'll start growing uh, in the next 10 years. So uh, well, one of the biggest opportunities, of course, uh, as long as we capture that increasing market, uh, then uh, there is an opportunity. It's a very obvious answer. But uh, how, how do we go into this? Uh, uh, the second box, as we see in the green box, uh, technically it is uh, one of the um, opportunities here in China is the tier two and tier three cities. They are actually in a, a increasing, a, a much high increasing demand in terms of uh, the demand for good international educations uh, compared to tier one cities. Um, and uh, how is that? For example, such as um, in the last year, there are four international schools being opened, or not uh, last year, this year, September, there are four international schools open in Dongguan. Uh, Dongguan is a tier two cities, uh, one of the richest cities in the whole uh, Greater Bay Area. And uh, it sees actually the biggest growth uh, among all the cities in China. And so uh, more international schools right now is going to tier two cities. And so um, uh, as we can see uh, from the market in Beijing and Shanghai, um, some in uh, Guangzhou as well, the market's pretty saturated. Uh, and right now, many of the brands now is going into tier two, uh, some of them even go to tier three cities. And, um, and actually that just only starts it. And we see that as a demand for uh, the coming 10 years. Uh, for how we actually enter the market. So uh, if any one of you wants to go into the market, tier two and tier three cities would be um, the market that you should go into. Uh, and the third box, uh, the orange box, you see the normal surface to quality surface. What I actually mean is the understanding of parents uh, and students in terms of uh, international education is, is growing. Um, from previously about 10 years ago, um, or maybe 15 years ago, most of the curriculum, international curriculum in international schools are Canadian, in, uh, are Canadian curriculums. Why is that? Because there's the easiest, easiest curriculum that you can partner with uh, in the world. Because you can just partner with a province in can Canada. And that is pretty easy because the relationship between Canada and China is good. And on the other hand, the, in the province level and the city's level of government, they work together in terms of delivering that. And uh, in the last 10 years, uh, more IB, A-level, uh, and some AP schools are actually entering uh, the China market. Uh, and that actually, in terms of the system's uh, sophistication, and in terms of um, the whole uh, education delivery and quality and training worldwide, is much more uh, developed compared to the Canadian curriculum. So uh, in the past five years, we can see the Canadian curriculum, actually the demand for that is going down. Uh, and the demand for IB A level uh, is going up. And so um, uh, uh, one of the example is uh, Cambridge International uh, Examination Center. They're opening up in China in the past five years and that is a dramatic growth uh, to about uh, 300 centers in China right now, uh, where in the past uh, 10 years, possibly there's only a few um, in China. And so uh, that uh, what we see is we are going from um, uh, a 
very vague understanding of international education to uh, a deeper understanding of education from the parents' point of view. And so what the opportunity here is uh, for probably some of you from Hong Kong or from, from other parts of the world, uh, as you, we actually have uh, the international education background uh, and receive education from other countries, uh, we have a better understanding in this market. So uh, when we actually en enter the market, we're actually in a better position in terms of providing quality service uh, to our parents and students um, compared to some of the providers in China. And so uh, that is one of the, uh, the market and differentiation that we can give uh, to the market. Uh, just now, Marianne mentioned about online education, um, where is the red box uh, uh, shows. Um, and from the past, uh, five, 10 years, many of you have heard about the, the terms O2O um, and we call it the online to offline. So we, how we used online marketing to actually help to sell uh, in the offline world. Uh, and most of them are for products. And right now uh, in the past one year uh, to two years, uh, the, another term comes up is called OMO, which is to, on, uh, to merge online and offline. Uh, and that is specifically very, um, uh, important in the in the service industry and education is one of them. And so a lot of the strategy that uh, uh, different companies use, such as the New Oriental and Huawei Lai, uh, which is both two big companies listed in, in the US, uh, the two biggest uh, list, listed Chinese education company in the US, um, they, uh, they, uh, they're actually going into this strategy of OMO. And um, the key reason, as Mariana mentioned, really is the difficulty of uh, really providing a quality online education uh, compared to offline. And so uh, uh, the better solution for that, uh, as the market see, really is to mix, to merge both of them. And um, so uh, the opportunity here is uh, uh, this market is pretty new. Uh, how do we actually uh, merge online, offline education in a better way? Uh, this is a whole big uh, research area and big opportunity that we all see. Um, so um, I think um, a, lot of, a lot of you, uh, when you enter the market, uh, this is definitely one of the biggest market, uh, biggest growth market uh, in the next five years. So um, uh, if there's anyone wants to go to, into education, I would suggest definitely this is the uh, probably the most innovative market uh, in education in the next five years. Um, the sixth, uh, the fourth, uh, the fifth box, sorry, the fifth box, um, I, I put it property plus education. Um, one of the gap uh, in the market right now is um, some, some, some of you might actually know about the change of property market in China, um, that uh, they are expanding to other industries, not just property. So they all call them property plus. Um, so some of them is property plus, say, um, medical industry or some plus with, uh, uh, cultural uh, tourism or different industries. And one of them is uh, Property Plus Education. Um, so a lot of uh, property companies right now set up their own education company, such as um, uh, Bi Gui Yuan, uh, which they have already listed in the US. Um, different companies such as Honda, such as um, uh, Ya Ju Le, Agile. They, most of them actually already started uh, the education industry, uh, education company with them. Um, so uh, it is an opportunity for you to actually work with these property companies and, and, and start with them uh, if you have the know-how compared to the property company itself. Um, the last one, um, as I call it, is the international education plus Chinese elements. Um, what is the area it actually means really is how we bring international education and Chinese element into uh, international school or actually in international education and bring it out to places outside China, especially uh, Southeast Asia. Um, when you travel to different countries in Southeast Asia, you will see how many people right now speak Mandarin and the demand for actually learning Chinese uh, and actually learning Chinese culture is huge. So um, this is a big market and which actually goes with uh, the, uh, the countries, uh, our country's uh, strategy of uh, Yida Yilu. So uh, this is uh, another big market where uh, you can look into, uh, where it's actually combined with the Chinese elements, national education and bring it out uh, of China into other countries. 
don't have much time left. Uh, oops, this box is a little bit distorted, but I can talk about this. So um, tension, or I call it one of the biggest challenge in actually setting up education company in China. Um, there are three, um, ten, there, there are three uh, dimensions here where it actually creates a big tension in the market when you're actually doing international education. One is the market demand. Sorry, I can show another. Uh, this one is better. Um, so it's one is market demand. Uh, second is regulatory force. And third is the business need. Um, there are actually three really separate um, uh, separate force, which is actually pulling away from each other. And one of the key thing in education in China is, to, is actually to find the sweet spot uh, combining these three areas. Uh, how? Let me explain a little bit. Uh, one of the biggest challenge is um, the parents in China actually understand, as I mentioned, education, international education more uh, than ever right now. And so um, uh, they would like to have a, a better a better delivery of international education um, in a school, such as um, how uh, the curriculum is being 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 set up, uh, how uh, what is the quality of the teachers, uh, Western teachers in China, and what's the quality of the Chinese teachers in China that they can actually deliver international education. So the demand for that and understanding for international education is uh, getting higher and higher. Um, however, on the other hand, uh, the regulatory uh, force there uh, put in another way. Um, as all of you understand how um, the political uh, dimension in China where they, the government uh, is requiring different schools, uh, especially right now, they, they set up the requirement for universities to actually set up, um, uh, um, to set, set up the uh, party's uh, uh, department in, in the universities. And actually a lot of the uh, the private schools or international schools are required to do so as well. So um, uh, with that in hand, uh, a lot of international uh, curriculum materials would not be able to uh, be provided in the schools, uh, which was uh, uh, which was a requirement from the government um, from the end of last year. And uh, there was a regulation that came up uh, which uh, do not allow international uh, curriculum material to be provided in compulsory education, which is year one to year nine uh, level. Um, so how do we actually get through this uh, is another big question uh, in the market right now. But the last one is the business dimension, where uh, as all of you would understand how we run the education business, where uh, we have to, in a business point of view, we have to increase our profit. But on the other hand, in the education point of view, we have to provide the best of the education service to our students. And that sometimes do not go together. Um, and so there are three dimensions. One's parents' dimension, one's business, possibly the business owner's dimensions. And the third is the government's dimension. They are pulling away from each other. And how do we find the sweet spot there uh, would be one of the biggest questions for any of you who wants to go into the market. And uh, I think a lot of the people right now in the industry are also searching um, for their for their sweet spot themselves as well. Um, so um, if you have many any particular question, you can put in the chat. I can answer. But um, I think my time's up. I'll pass it on to Sam. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Danny. Um, I am uh, Sam Wu. I am the executive director of Babylon Education Group, which is um, we are a the Asia Pacific partner of uh, Melbourne College, which is a um, which is a UK boarding school, was founded in 1865, and um, throughout these um, ten years, actually, uh, the the Melbourne College brand um, went through rapid overseas um, expansion. We have uh, first school was set up in Qingdao in 2012, uh, and then Chengdu, and then in Hong Kong we have the uh, we have main school, um, Melvin College Hong Kong, which set up is, uh, in 2018. And we have two um, kindergartens as well. And uh, we also have an affiliated school that is um, uh, set up by a uh, Middle Eastern investor in Cairo, Egypt, and that was in 2016. Um, but um, in my presentation, I'm going to mainly focus on Hong Kong and uh, China. 
Um, Mariana and Danny went through uh, a lot of the materials, um, so I'm not going to repeat on what they've said. I will main, I will um, dive into um, uh, more of the operational side of things. And uh, firstly, um, this uh, the the discussion about uh, profit and non-profit. I think this uh, is more applicable for Hong Kong and um, Asia uh, because in China. Um, People are more um, willing to pay for education, but in Hong Kong, you know, we always have the debate about the school fees and then and the ventures, um, you know, that being very pricey. Well, traditionally, um, education we all see it as a public good. You know, it's a social and legal entitlement. You know, uh, you have, it's a compulsory uh, thing to do uh, to receive uh, education, but. Um, education is actually quite costly. It's very expensive. It's very labor intensive on um, operationally. Um, you know, you, you need to put in a lot of equipment, you know, people, uh, resources, but these are usually very heavily subsidized by the state or by NGOs, religious organizations. Um, private schools do exist. You know, they've, they've been in existence for a very long time, especially in England, uh, you know, the US, you know, in the US, we ha you have the prep schools. And in the UK, you have the independent schools, public schools. And in Hong Kong, you have the uh, so-called DSS schools, which um, they are semi-public, uh, semi-private as well. Um, these schools um, tend to serve a more specialized sector, you know, for people who are willing to pay for a uh, you know, better class size and uh, student ratio, um, you know, better uh, teaching staff facilities, and uh, better future prospect, you know, firstly placement, and, you know, and sometimes it goes into social standing and family tradition. And um, the growing expectations that we see from parents, you know, uh, it's increasing, especially, uh, like Danny mentioned, a lot of us, you know, we, all of us had um, tertiary education, you know, in, in Hong Kong overseas, you know, we've been, you know, around the world, you know, so we, 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 we need, uh, we, there's a very strong demand for quality education and uh, increases in disposable, disposable income. Um, people are very willing to pay for private school, um, especially um, those uh, with a international curriculum. So this, uh, like the other two panelists said, is a very huge market. Um, and uh, especially in China, um, you know, people are putting very high expectations on the and children because of the uh, legacy of the one child policy. You know, so they, are, they were willing to invest everything into that one single basket. So um, what happens is this drives up the demand for the schools and it drives up the demand of teachers. Um, the hiring has been very difficult for us because um, the popularity of uh, especially British-based education in Asia and globally. Um, so the uh, teachers' wages and benefits are very, very high. Um, uh, and especially in Hong Kong, you know, due to the economic growth and affluence of the region. Um, um, Hong Kong being one of the first Asian cities with a international with uh, international schools, um, uh, they so that we, we our um, paying basis our, our wage basis has been here for more than forty to fifty years. So we so that's why it, it racks up a lot uh, on on the labor costs. And so we, I just went over uh, the, um, you know, costs and, you know, expectations and everything, you know, that, but um, we, are, we are private schools, but schools um, are expected to serve with a public uh, character. You know, we are expected to serve for the benefit of the society. This is very, very different from um, other private enter enterprises because, uh, you know, they can just sell the products and, you know, that's it, and then uh, customer satisfaction. But we, uh, uh, we have to serve more than just customer satisfaction. We have to actually produce um, students who are actually beneficial to the society. So there are some um, public duties that we need to serve. And uh, another interesting factor is, um, you know, we have parents complaining about um, the increases. You know, we have parents very concerned, you know, everyone's very concerned about um, fee increases, but the demand for international education, private education is very inelastic. But 
it's also very price sensitive. Um, so um, parents are willing to pay more, uh, significantly more for schooling, but uh, they're very price sensitive. You know, uh, for example, for this year in, um, during the, the, the this COVID outbreak, you know, we, we do have parents asking about, you know, um, price uh, freezing or fee reductions, but um, it shows that it is very price sensitive, but generally people are still willing to pay for this market. And to that degree, some parents are willing to pay at all costs to obtain admission. And that goes into um, the debentures and nomination rights. Um, for those who are not familiar with this idea, um, debentures are a, um, it's, it's an interest rate loan to the school, which is repayable at the end of uh, when the student leaves the school or graduates. And in return for this interest-free uh, loan to the school, um, certain fees are waived um, uh, on the students uh, for their um, con capital contribution to the school. And, uh, you know, uh, um, therefore, with all of the above, um, you know, if such a high operating costs, you know, parents' expectation and a very strong demand because of Asian tradition on emphasis on education, there are very, uh, there's a vast business opportunities in this sector. So, and then I'm going to talk about um, bringing the brand into China. Um, so, um, Danny mentioned, as Danny mentioned, um, the market is still in this, uh, I would consider it still in its beginning stages outside of the tier one cities, um, Shanghai and Beijing. Um, because um, in Shanghai and Beijing, um, there are many, many international schools. And, and, and I believe in Shanghai, there's around 150 of them. And Beijing, I think, uh, uh, easily uh, equivalent number. And huge demand in China, um, like Mariana said, uh, lots of parents do not want to see the kids go through the Gaokao, the um, high school exam process, um, because it's very grueling for them and the parents um, um, do not want their kids to go through that process. And uh, so that uh, sets up the um, market demand for China, but um, there are also um, lots of uh, difficulties, challenges, um, like the ones Danny went through regulatory. Um, I'll go into the more of the market side of things. Um, first of all, you have imperfect market information. Parents are still, um, they understand the concept of international education, but they might not understand the curriculum, um, you know, what's really inside edu uh, international education. Um, parents are very fixated on branding, on super brands. So you tell them Eton, everyone knows what that is. You tell them Oxbridge, they know what that is. You, I tell them Malvern, you know, they will start, they will need to think of it you know, because they have never heard of that brand name before. And sometimes they get confused with uh, the quality of teaching, with, um, with pricing, with the school fees. Um, they might think the higher the school fee is, the better the school it is. Um, exam results, school rankings, because um, you, um, you know, we, all know that um, there are lots of these um, school rankings out there. Um, you know, er everyone measures with a different ruler, and uh, so it's uh, it's a huge uh, mixed bag of um, school rankings and uh, results rankings. But um, parents, um, without a perfect benchmark, they have to rely on uh, those rankings. And even celebrity effects. You know, which, who, which celebrity, which singer puts the schools, uh, the, the kids into which schools? At, um, you know creates a lot of uh, interest. So we have to educate the market. We have lots of personal engagement versus top line marketing. You know, we, uh, we do place ads, but lots of, um, mostly our marketing is um, people to people, you know, and just talking and, and educating. Um, barriers of entry, political, uh, so all men, uh, as Danny mentioned, social, cultural differences, these have to be resolved. And of course, fitting into the local system for licensing and regulatory requirements, you know, um, like Danny mentioned, um, how, how do you bring about uh, introducing an international educate uh, as international curriculum that might be very sensitive to the local government? And apart from China, we actually seen this in other Asian markets as well, um, in Korea and especially Japan. Japan doesn't have any foreign branded international schools. Um, they have international schools, but they are um, founded by uh, Japanese educators. Um, they have very similar concerns of bringing in foreign um, curriculum. You know, they're afraid that uh, it will uh, 
affect their cultural and values and, and all these things. And uh, one of the key points for bringing a brand in China, I would think, is having a home base here in Hong Kong because of the uh, history. You know, we have international schools. Um, we have uh, schools for uh, British expats you know, since the 1930s. So it gives us a very um, huge edge, especially for those um, who are interested to invest in the Greater Bay Pearl River Delta area. Uh, having a Hong Kong home base makes a huge difference because you have the government and policy support. And as Danny mentioned, um, foreign investors are also highly interested in this space. Um, uh, we uh, ourselves have actually entered into one of the Property Plus um, education uh, deals uh, quite recently. So it's uh, there, 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 there are property investors who are interested in to acquire um, education-based um, properties and then um, convert them, uh, inject them into a REIT or into a property fund um, that is um, anchored on, um, on uh, education-related uh, tenants because you know, we can sign we need to sign very, very long um, leases for, for school. I can't sign a five-year lease for school. It has to be 20, 30 years. So that is the space that a lot of uh, foreign investors are interest, in, interested because it's very, very stable income. And uh, I have two minutes here. Um, uh, I'll quickly go over the geopolitics and the COVID impact. Um, thankfully, we have very understanding parents and staff. You know, They have been... Uh, it's very, very helpful, very minimal turnover because um, our, our parents are very um, uh, supportive of, for our uh, change uh, into online and in, uh, online teaching. And um, the key takeaway I would say is um, uh, for a school to succeed in this uh, environment is to allow in your, in your curriculum, to allow flexibility to switch between online and in-class teaching very rapidly. So. You have actually, uh, for us right now, we have both things going. We, in Hong Kong, we have um, all, uh, all the classes have resumed, um, but we still have a very strong online component uh, compared to what we did one or two years ago. So parents uh, in that way are more willing to accept online teaching. Um, and uh, our, you know, thankfully our kids are no longer complaining that we have to wake up early for class. And I think none of them will complain ever again for going to school. And, um, it, and also the COVID-19, I would say, is a key driver to accelerating um, tech implementation by, by at least three to five years, for, at least for ourselves. You know, we've never thought of doing things, um, but um, maybe three to five years down the road, but we're actually doing it right now. And um, we are also considering investments, uh, heavy investments into tech and into uh, AI and VR presence, online content um, into our curriculum and into our investments. And I believe my time is up, so uh, I'll pass it back. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for um, your views on the Chinese industry, uh, education industry. So now we have uh, a few questions for the panelists. Um, have there been any studies as to the effectiveness of private schools compared to government schools? And like how have those um, graduates performed in terms of domestic and overseas uh, university placements? Well, this is Mary and I'll take a step at that. I think um, there is pretty wide, um, I think, differences across the quality of public schools. So I think that's um, kind of a, a unique um, nature of China is in the public school market, there are a handful of schools that actually got a lot of resources, what we call like key schools. Um, they, they got a lot of allocation of the top teachers, the top kind of you know capital from the government, allocation from the government to, to, to um, invest in a lot of the, the facilities, whatnot. So usually in a lot of the cities, you have a small number of really good public schools and then you have like a bunch of private schools that you know parents whose kids actually can't make it to the top public schools they end up paying extra to go to private schools and then at the kind of the bottom you have a lot of other public schools that actually might not get a lot of resources because they are highly concentrated in the handful at the top so i think because of that that's probably a little bit hard to argue you know to, to do a, a just a, a statistics analysis on just public versus private but it tends to be the case that if you don't get into top 
few public schools, then you know the quality of the public schools drop massively. So then you might much be better off going to private schools. And of course, the private schools use the statistics of the number of students getting into Beida Tsinghua or like the top, um, you know, the top uh, hundreds of public school or public universities in China. They're highly regarded as a marketing stat to to attract parents. So um, yeah, so I would. I would argue that I think um, generally speaking, public schools quality would be better, but it's just because for public schools, there are a handful that are really good, but the, the handful of really good ones tend to be like really excelling in the city. Um, I hope that sheds some light <laughs> to the question, um, but, the, but that's for, more for the domestic market. So maybe Danny and, and Sam could talk a little bit more on the international part. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll um, carry on with my Marianne's answer as well. Um, um, from this is more of a uh, personal experience uh, with our Qingdao school. Um, we founded in 2012, and um, one of our graduates actually was a uh, he has a physical um, disability, which means in China it would place him into the special needs school. And in China, the special needs schools they mix physical disability with mental disability. You know, so they do not make a very clear uh, distinction. So that they, uh, if, if he went into that stream, he would be mixed up with people who really had a mental disability, learning disorders and everything. But um, he went to our school and um, he really excelled. And um, for, uh, he was in our first cohort of graduates in 2015 and, uh, um, and he made it to MIT. Um, he was one of the seven people accepted in China for that year. And so it, it gives you a perspective that, um, you know, if they went through the international curriculum, you know, uh, some of the weaknesses or disabilities, whatever they have, you know, we, you know, we, we try to encourage them to, you know, bypass or overcome that thing or actually make it into an advantage that um, gives them a even sharper edge um, to make it into one of the really top, um, universities or institutions. So uh, that's based on my uh, personal experience. Sorry, actually, Alana, I didn't really catch the question. Can you repeat that? Yeah, the question is, have there been any studies as to the effectiveness of private schools compared to government schools and how those graduates perform in the um, university placement exams. All right, okay. Um, a very, well, I'll, I'll talk about this in a in international education's point of view. Um, public school, they are international departments in some of the public schools in China. Um, that was one of the biggest market previously. Um, but right now, the, well, actually about three years ago, the government gave a, um, a, a stop in that uh, area where one of the uh, example is um, a lot of the international departments in public schools in Beijing was being asked to leave those public schools. And um, so it also in because of this, the international, the international schools uh, 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 the standalone international school actually expanded because of that. Um, so if I actually try to compare the international departments in public schools and international schools uh, in general, um, the one of the very interesting thing is uh, we can see really good students in international departments in public schools, in some of the schools. And the reason why is because those public schools are, are, are originally really good, uh, are really good public schools. And so they have really good student base uh, historically. And so that draw really good students to those international departments in public schools. Um, so actually uh, that, if, you, if we actually talk about that, then uh, there, there is a, a good outcome for uh, university applications. Um, for public school, as for international departments in public schools, um, such as uh, there's a school in Beijing called Renda Fuzhong, and the international departments create really good students uh, for international uh, for for universities in in the international world. Um, however, because as I mentioned, the government regulatory um, 
requirement that uh, needs them to uh, need the need the departments to actually uh, to to stop running. And uh, so some students are actually going into other international schools. But however, still, um, although uh, although that there, there is a requirement from the government, but there are still international departments in um, in public schools because of different reasons. Um, and yet also there in this September onward, there are some new uh, international departments being um, being supported and being approved by the governments uh, in Hainan and in Beijing this year. Um, and so it's a very tricky uh, environment, but if we're really talking about, if we're looking to the statistics, um, one of the biggest, um, uh, uh, one of the best international, so in terms of university applications in Oxbridge entries, uh, is one of the school in Shenzhen called um, uh, Shenzhen Guoji Jiao Liu Xue Yuan, and they are send, sending 20 to 30 uh, students to Oxbridge every year. And arguably will be one of the most uh, the highest number amount China and possibly in Asia as well. So uh, if you talk about the top uh, top international uh, universities applications, uh, the private schools actually is heading the market. Um, and uh, this market's growing as well uh, in terms of the how the private schools actually provide uh, giving really good uh, 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 international education to the students and so they can go into the best universities in the world. Um, so uh, probably if you look into the statistics there in the top 10 schools sending students uh, specifically to say Oxbridge, um, more than five of them are private schools. I don't remember exact figures, probably about seven to eight of them uh, are private schools uh, and the rest are public schools. So that give probably a, a dimension of uh, how, how the applications goes between public and private schools in, in, in international applications. Great, thank you. And um, more onto the private school side, what is the typical percentage of um, foreign teachers in the typical private school? And what is the process of becoming a foreign teacher? Is it more difficult due to COVID-19 or geopolitics? Sam, do you want to answer this question? Yes, I'll... I'll... Um, for our schools in um, Chengdu and Qingdao, um, I think the, the, it's 90 plus percent. Um, it's uh, apart from, literally apart from the Chinese teacher who is Chinese. Um, um, the teachers are all expats. And uh, yes, um, there is a process. Um, um, our teachers um, do get trained in the UK first. Um, and uh, and uh, yes, the COVID-19 and the geopolitics, um, US, uh, Sino-US um, dispute you know, has made um, hiring a little bit more difficult because um, you know, we have to go through the government as well. But um, mainly our staff comes from the UK, um, New Zealand and Australia. So, so, and, and they have been working all over the world before coming to our schools. Um, most, a lot of them have worked in the Middle East, which there are also very similar government requirements in the Middle East um, due to um, cultural and religious requirements. So um, uh, for us, um, it's um, it's more of an inconvenience than a problem. But um, like I mentioned in my um, presentation, um, the demand for um, expat teachers has risen a lot recently uh, these few years. and really does um, drive up our um, difficulty and our cost of um, hiring good teachers. Uh, I, I can answer um, from uh, another perspective to this question. Um, well, of course, if you want to apply to any schools, um, you just go to, you just go to the the, the, the schools and just apply for it. I mean, all, all the schools have their own HR. Um, but uh, in terms of the ratios and the number of foreign teachers really varies, depends on what kind of international schools you are. Uh, one of the, um, the difference between how we, we define international schools in China, one is uh, one, school, one type of school where only receive uh, foreign passport holders and they have uh, normally have a higher number of uh, foreign uh, Western teachers. And another type of international schools are privatized, well, not private, sorry, um, 
internationalized private schools. So they're actually private schools are receiving local students, but they have international elements in it uh, to make it so-called international school. And so that types of schools actually have normally a lower ratio of foreign uh, Western teachers. Um, so it really depends on uh, what type of schools that you're applying for. And some of the private schools not offering international curriculums also uh, receive applications for Western teachers because they would like them to uh, teach, say, the English uh, class or some other, say, public speaking classes. Um, so it depends on what kind of schools that you're applying for. Ariana, Mariana, do you have anything to add to? Um, not much on this point. Okay, sure. Um, so since we received a few questions from attendees, um, we, I will chose a few um, for you guys to answer. Um, so this is a question from Yutin. Um, he's, he or she wants to know, how do you select a further growth, the type of curriculum that is developed? that is appropriate for international education for early childhood uh, in China and Hong Kong? How do you select the curriculum for early childhood? Uh, Danny and Sam, do you have anything to, to add to that? Sam, you want to go first or? Uh, Danny, you can go first. I'm still reading the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm also trying to understand the question as well. Um, uh, well, well, technically, uh, let me guess. I, I guess the audience is trying to ask, um, uh, to ask if, if the audience is actually going into the market and, and, uh, and trying to say create a business or actually providing service to the early education market, uh, specifically in the curriculum uh, development point of view, uh, how does the, the, the audience uh, enter the market or what is the gap there? Uh, I, I guess the, the audience actually are, are asking uh, such a question. Um, uh, well, uh, I'll answer in a, a broader point of view. Um, early child education in China is compared to um, the compulsory education, which is year one to year nine, and the high school education, there are more innovation into it. There are more creativity into it. And actually, I, I think that is um, also the same in the international world as well. Um, so in, in terms of how you do the curriculum developments, uh, Many of the kindergartens or many of the early child uh, center, uh, education center, they create their own curriculums, uh, which is also the same in Hong Kong in, in the international world as well, uh, because of the less requirement from the government for what you have to teach. Um, so um, so, so th there is a, there's a big space there and a lot of creativity is actually going into this and a lot of uh, different types of uh, early child education model also goes into this uh, area as well. Um, I think one of the, um, well, actually Sam mentioned earlier about uh, the SCN students, how you, you deal with that would be one of the, the market that I think the, the, the person, uh, the audience can go into. But on the other hand, um, I think uh, because of the international education market, uh, as I mentioned in the first place, the understanding of international market um, is going uh, going deeper and deeper, and specifically for the younger parents. So, for example, it's like us, um, so the parents who actually probably study uh, universities outside and come back to China, and they gave birth to their own child, they have a deep understanding of international educations. So, uh, and that is the the biggest growth in the need uh, for international education in the market. And they understand deeply about what uh, education, uh, international education really is. So um, in, in that dimension, uh, uh, the, the product that you, you have to provide or the curriculum that you're providing really have to um, uh, give a, a, what we call authentic international experience to the kids. Um, but on the other hand, uh, in, in China, mainland China specifically, uh, you have to mix with what the local parents really need. 
um, and we, we call it the fusion education. So you, you really need to uh, give the idea of, uh, for the students of how, say, the importance of Chinese is rather than actually most of the English uh, learning environment in Hong Kong that we're providing. Um, how the Chinese culture uh, is uh, in China and you have to develop them rather than actually being a Westerner from parents' point of view, you have to provide education so, so the students actually becomes a Chinese uh, international person uh, when they grow up. I think that is a fundamental need uh, for the parents in China. Um, and so it, I, I think uh, it's very easy to go to the way to say, um, well, the Finland education is really good or the, what, what the UK or the US education is really good. So I, I copy that and bring it to China. Um, I think uh, uh, that has a selling point, but the key thing really is how we make sure that type of curriculum goes localized and make sure ultimately the students becomes a Chinese person rather than a US or UK person or, or a, fin, a Finland person in the end. Um, I think that is the fundamental uh, uh, idea or, or philosophy behind um, the education, especially for the early child. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna just kind of highlight a point. I think Danny made a really good point about the localization of it. Uh, I think in the education market in general, from a regulatory point of view, although I, I would argue and definitely agree that early childhood is a segment that's uh, relatively less regulated, it's much easier in terms of the curriculum design. But I think from the government's point of view, the Chinese values and how much like the curriculum um, management as we know, the curriculum management and the Chinese values would be um, hard, is one of the high priorities um, from the government's point of view. So I think um, with that design or just kind of introducing new uh, concepts or kind of um, new, new elements into bringing that into China, I think you will have to pragmatically consider those factors on um, regulatory environment and also localization. But I think eventually from a more of a business point of view, how that really fit into the picture because the kids are definitely going through early childhood education, but of course, then there will be the next steps, right? How do you, how do that particular curriculum would fit into the next steps? And that's essentially how the parents are, would be thinking as well, right? Like if I put, I send my kids going to these sort of classes, how would that help them into moving into the next stages? So I think um, that's also, you know, again, going back into the, getting into top universities, whether locally or internationally going abroad, um, that's still, you know, one of the top things in the China, you know, Chinese parents' mind. So I think that's kind of, you know, something to keep in mind when, when you come up with the design the curriculum. Of course, there's more of an um, intellectual academic point of view on what's really like great for the kids' development. But from a business model's point of view, I think those um, factors would also be key in terms of how you could uh, build a sustainable business in education. Um, Sam, do you have anything to add to that? If not, we will move to the next question. Okay, um, so we have an um, interesting question from Wayne about agile technology. Um, so China is leading on online application. So he wants to know your perspective on education technology. Um, if there's any successful online approach in China that they could take reference to. Mariwana, do you want to um, start answering this question? I'm sorry, would you mind repeating that? I was just reading the chat room. <laughs> yeah, um, so this question is more about your perspective on education technology, because um, oh. I know you you have a, you also specialized in um, edutech as well. Yeah, I think I think I read that question earlier on the effective list. I haven't really seen um, like with the in-depth study on how how much right, incremental kind of um, effectiveness or productivity that education technology has really uh, added to because we're still very early stage we are still moving to that a lot of innovations are coming through um, but I think definitely the big value at least in the China context is there is a huge difference in terms of resources in tier one cities uh, versus tier three cities in terms of the teachers quality as well so I think one of the big value add for ed tech is actually opening up a lot of the resources that are available to top tier students into like going into the lower tier cities. I think that's a big value in the China context. Uh, but I think in a more generic kind of global context, um, I think one of the 
huge potential that everyone is really looking for is the personalization of it, right? The data that captured that could really help you um, increase the, the effectiveness of the learning and it could actually address certain topic, particular topics um, that you might need extra help on or whatnot. So that actually would help um, save time on the student's end, but also kind of um, helped the teacher in terms of addressing the particular like topics and, and really um, increase the effectiveness, so to speak. But um, but if I haven't really seen an actual study that actually did a control experiment, for example, like on, on the um, on the kind of the factor one hour white paper, one hour on the additional scores that they put, that that um, child actually um, achieved. So I haven't really seen a study, but I think that's definitely a, a huge potential that we are looking forward to. And I think they, I have seen a lot of the market trends reports and we are also kind of agreeing on, on the same trend is I think the Big, really big potential is each child eventually because each child is different right it's unique right so your your you know the the level of absorption in terms of knowledge would be very different so the ideal end goal really would be for each kid to have a, a profile right to have a digital profile whereby from early childhood stage all the way till Actually, nowadays we talk about lifelong learning, right? So it could be the rest of, for the rest of his or her life that you capture everything, right? All the all the data points that 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 person actually went through in terms of even winter camps, summer camps, um, study tours that they they went to, or extracurricular classes that they actually went through, and you have a complete analysis um, on on that particular kid, and that could be used for many different purposes in terms of um, you know looking for a job later on, applying for schools, whatnot. So I think that's the huge potential that we're going through um, but we are still in early stage in terms of capturing the data points but I think I'm quite hopeful that that's the way you know we are moving forward but in terms of China context as I mentioned the, I think the big value add is really opening up resources more so from a more um, education equality point of view you're helping a lot of the low, kids in lower tier cities thank you um, Danny and Sam, do you have anything to add to that? On education technology. We'd love to hear your perspective on um, how you think educa uh, education technology would change um, the operations of your schools. And would you consider implementing that to your operations? Sam, you go first. Okay, okay, yes. Um, uh, yes, we are actually implementing a lot of the EdTech AI things in our school. Um, um, uh, first of all, we, we are using a lot of um, robotics um, in our uh, teaching. Um, you know, in our language classes, we have um, reading robots. You know, so so the, the kids can read the story with the robots. And of course, and a lot of um, robotic and um, design uh, uh, robotics and assisted uh, assisted um, things in the um, in, in our um, DNT uh, design and technology classes. So, um, so um, they are learning to uh, on a lot of these things. And for operational reasons as well, um, given the current COVID nineteen situation, um, we are expecting that to be um, even further be implemented. Um, and I think a lot of it would be on AI and virtual reality because you know uh, if, if this um, pandemic goes on, you know, um, we we will need uh, a um, another we need other methods rather than just using Zoom. Um, we will probably need to use uh, more on the virtual reality um, uh, presence as well um, to to create a real virtual classroom where everyone you know puts on their three D glasses and, and they can participate because um. Yes, Zoom might be the a temporary stopgap measure, you know, like what we are doing here. We, we can chat face to face, but um, for real interaction, uh, Zoom, uh, we think it's in the long term is not viable. So we are definitely looking into uh, implementing uh, ed tech and AI into our uh, curriculum. And that is being done right now as we as just been talking. Um. Okay, I can touch a little bit in this. Uh, so in our own business, so we, we actually run schools in the UK and we run schools in China. 
So uh, our school branch is called B School. Uh, our, our school in the UK um, is a school with a 438 years history, uh, with a very long history. And, um, and we're, 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 uh, we're running the same schools in China as well, just B schools in China. So uh, in our point of view, um, technology and education uh, in, in, in the current world, in, in what we're doing right now, actually split into four areas. One is um, providing tech education to students. For example, how we teach students, as, um, as Samuel say, about robotics and how we teach, say, coding in our schools. That's one area. Uh, second area is uh, how we use technology in terms of our management, because we are running schools in UK and China. Uh, how we manage the school better in, in te using technology. Uh, the third one is doing assessment, how we assess the students quality using technology. And there are many actually tech services that should go into this market. Um, and uh, and uh, lastly is how we provide, how we use technology in the provision of the education itself. Uh, for example, say if we have teachers in the UK, uh, which is specialized in one area uh, of, of teaching, uh, how do we use technology to teach students in China? Um, so technically as uh, what the easiest way is actually as Sam mentioned using Zoom, um, the teachers in UK teaching the kids in China using Zoom uh, in some specific areas. So uh, there, there are different areas really in, in technologies and education. I'll, I'll like to talk about the last one. Um, so in what we're doing right now in, in St. Bees, uh, since we're running schools in China and UK, um, uh, as, as they are really different, different specialists in different areas in our schools. So uh, we're actually doing a lot of um, teachings online right now in the school setting. So some of our students actually uh, would like to learn um, uh, some curriculum that are, are say our Dongguan school is actually not offering. And so uh, we're offering them the opportunity to actually learn from our UK uh, teachers. And so um, uh, in, in that point of view, uh, setting up a platform where actually cross over different schools uh, is what we're doing right now uh, to help the students, uh, whether it's in their class time or actually outside the class time, can reach out to our education resources uh, worldwide. Um, so that's the in internal system that we're creating. Uh, with that internal system that we're creating right now, we'll be able to actually pull in resources and teachers, not only in our schools, but also in, in different parts uh, of the world and different teachers from different locations um, to actually allow them to reach out to different uh, uh, curriculums and resources, um, more than just what we our schools can actually provide. Um, so, uh, so that is something that uh, we're doing. And of course, because of the COVID situation, uh, we can't <laughs> travel right now, but uh, once the travel um, is open back uh, in normal, uh, because of the online platform that we're creating and with the students that are uh, being able to pull, in, pull out different resources from that, they'll be able to travel uh, to say the Chinese students go to UK and UK students come back to China um, and, and exchange in different projects they, they, they learn from online and, and, and meet those people and teachers, students that they learn online and even continue the education and the learning after going back to their home country to study. And so uh, that's what what we are creating in our own model of OMO, so the offline merge of online, um, as a as a as a platform, a system that uh, cross uh, goes cross across, um, you know, all our all our schools. Great, thank you. Um, now we have a question from Jess. Um, this is a question for Mariana. Um, so, with now more regulations on bilingual schools for China, is schools for, um, what will the future, how will the future impact um, for K-12 in the coming five, 10 years? Um, well, I think I think the regulatory environment is, well, I mean, I guess from the public investors point of view, I, I think the general atmosphere, everyone is like concerned that all the government is trying to um, tighten on the regulations um, on, on the education sector. But I think uh, what I always like to highlight to, to you know, the, to the audience is just the regulations, even though that we feel that it's tightening, but we just need to bear in mind that the title of the regulation is actually called uh, uh, the regulations for 
um, Min Chu Fasi, uh, so for basically promoting power education, right? So the idea is actually to set up a regulatory framework to attract power capital going into the education space. So I think the big picture is still um, the government would like more power capital to accelerate the growth of the education space clearly is um, very important to the economic development, right, for the country, um, education and, and human capital development, right? Um, but I think um, they all definitely details as we design and try to attract power capital. And then we start to um, put things into different categories. You have for profit categories, certain levels, we are um, hoping that they will only stay as not for profit and certain level, like compulsory levels. So the other levels would be open to for profit registration. But that being said, of course, we already have seen um, listed companies that are in K-12 segments um, and they're actually running K-12 schools and like, the details, I, I, I won't explain details, but essentially they're using a, what we call VIE structure that's very, quite, quite common in the internet space also is to using a bit uh, a variable interest entity that's similar to a kind of management company to, to do some transactions. Um, but I think the, the key takeaway I would probably just argue is just more of a, a near term um, kind of a phase that the, the, the country or the market, the industry needs to go through to set the framework uh, for more capital to go in. I think the, the idea the government still would like um, people to go invest into education. But you, to your point about more, more specific international schools, I think um, the traditional international schools, as, as Stanley mentioned, that are actually addressing to more expat kids. Um, I think that's, that segment is definitely very more of a premium segment, um, but that's also a segment that might, in my view is also a little bit harder to to go in to replicate into lower tier cities because you, you just don't have that many expats right or people with more foreign passports but the bilingual model which is essentially more of a chinese well you're following a chinese curriculum but you add a lot more international elements to it i think that's a model that's um that's got a lot more potential um it's more of a uh um, also a premium product in a, in a local setting, right? So you're allowing a international or global product um, that could open a lot more doors for Chinese students. I think that's a segment that a lot of the Chinese parents would look into. Uh, but of course, there's always that concern or argument that, or oh, would the government really be really um, concerned that, you know, on, on, you know, on the curriculum because it's still got an international element in it um, but hence that's why they have uh, they are very straight and clear now that you have to follow um, certain checkboxes right I think Danny and Sam would be able to tell you a little bit more on the curriculum um, that, but there's very strict requirements on following Chinese curriculum but you, you can actually add a lot more international elements to make it more of an international curriculum but then oh and then you can address the much bigger market for um, Chinese students um, and, and they are actually planning to go overseas later on so I think there is still a lot of potential in the bilingual market. Great, thank you. Um, thank you everyone for answering all the questions and thanks um, for the attendees for raising those questions. Um, I think we have answered all the questions raising from the attendees. Um, so I would like to thank everyone for your time um, today. Join us um, event on a Saturday morning and I hope um, everyone has enjoyed the rest of the day. Um, I just want to mention uh, the recording of this event will be put up on the NYU alumni live events website in about two weeks. Uh, we'll also put the recording on via the WeChat, Facebook and uh, LinkedIn through our normal NYU alumni in Hong Kong um, social media channels. So if anyone wants to um, watch the recording or you've got friends interested, please let them know and they can hear the expert views of the panelists that we've got today. Thank you very much. And a special thanks to the panelists for taking the time out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you.